success and fame, two very different things. And today's guest is actually living proof of that because comedian Jeff Allen has shared stages with Jerry Seinfeld and Arsenio Hall and really all the major names. And spoiler alert, he even shares some really cool stories about what he learned from those guys. And yet beyond being a comedic genius and in the spotlight is really a story of a man who's looking for purpose while facing addiction and despair. And the conversation we get into shares that and so much more. I had a sitcom pilot in 2000. That meant more to me than a letterman. Somebody spent $850,000 trying to get me on television. And that meant a lot. You've mentioned this a few times now, but I'm curious, what does religion give you? I believe it to be true. Life without God will have no meaning. Without meaning in your life, there's no purpose. Without purpose to your life, suicide. That's true. That's a deep, profound truth. Can you share with me the advice Seinfeld gave you? Oh, yeah. I did a show in Jersey at a college. I finished my set and they're clapping and cheering and I'm walking off and he's standing there and he stops me and he goes, that's for you. I go, what? He goes, that apply. Listen to that. You get so much of that, it doesn't mean anything to you. The one thing you can control is your act. Just get that right. I've never looked for work my entire career. And uh, he said, oh, we just did a sitcom pilot. And I said, well, what's it about? And he actually said that it's about nothing. <laughs> Welcome to The Mark Drager Show, where we explore the minds and stories of extraordinary entrepreneurs, creatives, and total badasses. Can you tell me the first time you got on stage, what that was like and why you did that? Yeah, I started, it was interesting. I, I, uh, my brother was a musician and um, I was probably 16 when I was at a club he was working. A couple of comedians went on stage, a team, a comedy team. And I thought, God, oh, I would love to do that. And it's not like they have a booth at the high school, you know, for career day on stand-up comedy. So anyway, you know, five or six years went by and I was working for a jewelry company and somebody said, do you want to go to the comedy cottage? And I go, what's that? He goes, well, these comedians get up and they just do it. And I went, oh, really? So maybe this is where the school is where you learn how to do this. So that was August. I think it was November. I got drunk enough uh, to work. The, I was there every night six nights a week um you know uh why so this is the late this is the late 70s right so right so you, no, late 70s yeah 78 so you're feeling it you're absorbing right. it but you just don't have the courage to get up there no, and, do it. I was, and i did some close-up magic at parties and stuff I, I, but i really wanted to do stand-up what these guys did and finally one night i was driving from my parents house after thanksgiving dinner and i, I stopped in thursday night was open mic night so anyway, I stop in and uh, I put my name on the list and uh, everybody runs out because they've known I've been wanting to do this. So I became friends with a number of them and I just, <laughs> atrocious. I, I, one, I didn't know you prepared material. I really okay, didn't. I, I was actually going to ask if you had like yeah, a five minute set or like what I you went nothing. up with. So I draw <laughs> a blank. I'm looking, I can't see because of the lights. I think my first line I, I can't repeat because it's just fall and uh i just holy you know I, anyway ran off humiliated drove home in a flurry of tears and the way i handle shame and humiliation i punched holes in my closet door so that's the way i handle it uh and sunday night was open mic night and i went back sunday and put my name down and this huge black mc came over to me uh, i became a dear friend of mine he said, you're going to have to make some sense tonight. We're still trying to figure out what you said Thursday night. <laughs> and that was my start. Um, uh, terrible stage fright. And it was weeks before I realized you actually wrote material. I never wrote anything. I just went up and tried to talk about my day and find some humor in it. The first routine I ever did that got huge laughs was I had a VW Bug, a 1968, 1969 VW Bug. And it was, it, uh, I couldn't afford to get the, starter fixed on it so i had to park it on a hill on a down slope <laughs> so I could oh that's the old it. that's the old way where you park it on a hill pop the clutch in second get and it go. started right so anyway I, I was late for my set i come running through the door i had to run a mile and a half because the car just completely blew out on me and i start screaming about this vw man anybody own one of these pieces of crap i mean my god you know, if you're lucky enough to get the heater going, it'll burn every hair off your ankle. It's like a blowtorch on the floor. I said, the, the, the frost is your breath and a rag, you know? And anyway, I realized like 40 seconds into it, people are laughing. So I walked off that night going, comedy is angst and it's truth. That's it. If you're angry and if it's true, you'll connect. 
I love the process of stand-up comedy. I really do. I like coming up with an idea and just seeing if it connects and then taking the words and trying to put them in a place that, um, you know, fits rhythm. And um, I just love the process of it. Uh, and uh, been at it since 1978. So, Yeah, you've put in some hours. Now, I am super curious why you went back. Because um, this is, and, and the reason I want to start here is because this is where like the magic is, right? The magic is y- you have some interest, you get drunk enough to have some courage, you put yourself in the arena, as they would say, right? Like, you know, you're the man in the arena and it, it goes terrible as anyone, as everyone should expect. Like, like if you follow that story up with... Um, and I slayed it. I crushed it. It was amazing. It's like, okay, well, that's weird. But but we all face these things that we want to do, that we'd love to do. And you have the courage to actually get up there and do it. I've studied comedy. I love comedy. I've gone to comedy clubs. I can always imagine myself being up there and trying it. And yet I've never done it. And so uh, the fact that you went back, though, that is amazing. You must have like you must have known that this is what you wanted to do. Or do you, are you just you love punishment? Well, I think I was either a sadist or a masochist. I don't know who was getting punished and enjoying it, me or the audience, but somebody was. <laughs> you know, my wife asked the same question when I met her. I was headlining clubs when I met her. And uh, she, when I told her this story, she goes, why would you go back? You know, And I said, well, I really felt if I could get over the stage fright. You know, and I had a club owner. I was about two years into it. And uh, he said, you, know, you realize you'll never make a living at this, right? You know, and I went, really? And he goes, yeah. He said, "Uh, you know, enjoy it. Do it as a hobby. Go to Holiday Inns, you know. And I said, thanks. He goes, you're welcome. I go, yeah, there hasn't been anybody in life that made anything of their life that didn't have some asshole tell them that they're not going to make anything of their life. And I said, you're my asshole. I said, I'll tell this story. I'm still telling it 44 years later, you know. (laughs) Have you sent him a card or flowers or anything? No, he's passed away. Since, but we became good friends. He had me out. He had a club in Vegas and he put me out there. And uh, he said he was proud of me. He said, uh, I, I really, for you to have accomplished what you've accomplished. But um, it really, you know, I didn't know any better. I got lucky. 1980, the clubs, of the you know, the clubs exploded in America. I mean, there were clubs everywhere. There was this huge boom, you know, in the in the in the eighties. Wasn't enough talent to fill the stages, so I mean, I got to be bad at something and uh, get paid a few bucks and make a living, and never really thought, you know, because they they used to have these guys come in and talk about business plans and what's your goals. You know, Arsenio Hall, uh, he got me my first paying gig, and uh, Arsenio was an interesting creature. Uh, he he had an entertainment lawyer. He had just started comedy. He had an entertainment lawyer. And I said, why would you do that? He goes, entertainment lawyers have entertainment clients. It's networking. I go, who cares? Just go up and tell jokes. I mean, I, I mean, really, I couldn't understand the idea of having a plan and then executing the plan. And uh, Arsenio knew what he wanted, knew where he was headed. And, uh, and he did, obviously, he did very well. But, uh, you know, me, I just wanted to stand on stage and tell jokes and figured everything would work itself out. And I had some lean times. I had some really lean times. But um, I think in God's time, you know, there were times I tried to get out. I tried to join the Air Force when I was 26. Uh, I had been doing it for four years. Really couldn't get a gig anywhere. And uh, went into the recruiter's office. He says, why do you want to join the Air Force at 26? I go, well, I'm a loser. You know, I can't think of anybody else who would have me, but the U.S. military. <laughs> you know, so anyway, uh, I took a test. They said, "Hey, we really like you. You can come in." And, uh, you know, it was basic math: a hundred math problems, three plus five, eight plus three. You know, and you know, I didn't get much out of school, but I could certainly add and subtract. So anyway, <laughs> the so, funniest so- story. I was sitting there in the recruiter's office and some Yahoo came in the door just and, and the recruiter from the Air Force says, can I help you? He goes, I want to fix helicopters like my daddy. And he goes, you know, the Marine Corps is down the hall there. They got a lot of helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> so he walks out and recruiter looks to me and goes, we don't just take everybody here at the Air Force. So you're special. And I was one day from taking the physical and going into the military. And uh, I got a call from somebody sent me off to Ohio. And uh, I, I jumped on a plane and I got hooked up with a chain of clubs and it kept me around for, and then I moved to LA and I was going to quit again. 
and uh, some things, some doors opened. And, you know, in hindsight, I look back and see a divine hand keeping me around uh, until I paid attention to him, you know. So, so help, help me understand the difference in the 80s between, let's say, your career, because you mentioned Arsenio, right? So Arsenio, you know, uh, was friends with Eddie Murphy, uh, was in Coming to America, got the Arsenio Hall show. Uh, for anyone who's younger, you may not realize that Bill Clinton, you know, played the saxophone on his show right. and it was this big deal. Right. And it was this huge thing, like this huge cultural thing. I, I was born in 83. Uh, so I remember being a young boy and doing the like whoop thing. Ooh, and, I like, know, ruin comedy. We hated that. Instead of laughing, they'd woo woo, you know, it's like, oh, stop it. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember yeah. watching the show and I remember Arsenio being something. And then, I mean, I, I honestly don't know what happened to him, but it was something and then it wasn't. But, but, you know, walk me through or, or help me understand in the 80s the difference between, say, what you were doing and uh, off the top of my head, right? There's Ellen, there's Drew Carey, there's, um, there's Seinfeld, there's Tim Allen, there's, it's just, it's, you know, Norm yeah. Macdonald. It just seemed like there was this explosion of like, like we need comedians. We need to put them on network television. We need to, we need to give them stuff and we need to turn these into famous people. And, uh, and then there's you, <laughs> I don't mean that in an insulting way, but th that there's you. <laughs> I was living in New York. I got married in 86. So I moved to Boston. Boston was the place to be in, in the 80s. Uh, you know, Stephen Wright had come out of there. Uh, but the whole vibe in Boston was just, I loved it. I loved everything about it. The problem was I had to get out of there before I killed myself with booze and drugs. But uh, anyway, I was invited. Somebody from New York saw me from Catch and said, hey, if you ever come to New York, I can put you on the stage at Catch. So we moved from Boston to New York. And I thought this would be my opportunity. And I had quit drinking. And uh, when I quit drinking, I, you know, I was kind of angry prior to the drinking, you know, when I was drinking, but when I quit drinking, I got really angry. And uh, I had a guy from HBO. I did an hour audition for him. He sat for the whole hour. And uh, when I got done, he goes, you're a funny guy, but man, you know, what is it with you Boston guys? You're so angry, you know? And uh, I mean, when the HBO guy took, you're too angry for HBO you know, after Kennison. You know? <laughs> yeah, that kind of tells you, you know, I, I might, I might, I gotta get, I gotta get out of New York. I, I needed to get out of there. I was going to choke somebody. I really was. I mean, I, it was a hard place for me to work. I was a, I call myself a walking scab. I was just a huge scabbed over wound and uh, just about everything just picked at it. And this pus would ooze out and I'd scream and holler on the stage and ran and rave and, um, anyway, um, and we moved to Arizona, which is where artists go to die. And, uh, I went to LA, uh, I walk into catch one night and the owner of stand up New York, who used to book me all the time. He really liked me comes over and he goes, I thought you got out of the business. And I said, well, that's what you want to hear when you're in California. <laughs> you're no longer working. So I, I, well, I told guess, my I guess wife, it could be worse. He could say, Oh, you're still alive. You're still alive. I thought for sure you'd be killed by now yeah exactly um yeah i missed it you know i was there uh when brian regan did his audition in new york uh for letterman and he just absolutely slayed just slayed and i saw him a few nights later and i said so when you're doing the show he goes they passed i go what and i went home and told my wife we got to move i mean if i can't do a better set than i saw brian do and it just there's no point. I was there to do the Letterman show. That was the only reason I was still hanging around New York. So uh, anyway, we moved to Arizona and um, God had other plans for us, uh, for me, and certainly for my career. Um, and uh, I just was tired. I, I tried to get out of it in, in, in Arizona. I started doing temp work and uh, I realized <laughs> I went to go to get a job at the post office and they tell me it was $10 an hour. And you know, I was think I was making two grand in the clubs at the time. I told my yeah, wife yeah. I, could, I could go out and do one club a month and make what I make. And then she goes and then sit on your rear end for three weeks. That's not going to happen, you know. But um, I think it was um, the temp agency called and wanted me to seat people for a comedy show. And they go, says you're a comedian. Will you seat people? And I'm not going to tell you the name of the comedian, but when my wife heard it, she goes, you're not seating anybody for that hack. And I said, he's working a theater. I mean, he's not a, she goes, he's a hack and you're not seating people for him. You're a comic, fire your agent. He's got you convinced you're useless. 
and I did. I fired my agent, and um, and then we uh, we ended up moving to Nashville, and, and things got mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to unpack there. So, um, you, you did mention that you've never done Carson, you've never done Letterman. Um, is that because of the people you surrounded yourself with? Is that because, as you mentioned earlier, you know, Arsenio had this idea of like this is how business needs to run, and you were just more focused on the craft, or wh- why do you suppose that is? Well, I believe one, I wasn't ready uh, in the sense mentally. I had a hard time. I remember seeing somebody, you know, I was in a phase of my recovery where it was visualization. You know, I was trying to visualize. And honestly, Mark, I couldn't see myself sitting on the couch next to cars. I could not visualize, close my eyes and see it. And the Letterman people, you know, this is the kind of guy I was, you know, I, uh, you remember Paula Poundstone? Yes, yes. Yes. Well, anyway, she goes on stage at catch one night and some drunk is just heckling her, just terrible, just trashing her. So I walk out on stage and uh, I say, uh, he starts on me. And I said, look, pal, I ain't a woman. I said, you keep on me. I'll shove a beer bottle so far up your ass, you'll spew it out your ears. And then I'll throw you in the first avenue. That was my opening line. And anyway, I go back on. It's New York. So anyway, I go on and I kill. I just absolutely kill. You know. And I had a line in there about getting a speeding ticket. And the policeman said, are you aware of how fast you were going? I go, well, yeah, I got a speedometer right in front of me. You know, car didn't come with much, but it came with a speed measuring device. The only thing I was unaware of is where you were sitting because I'd have slowed this puppy right down. <laughs> you know, anyway, the guy, some guy comes over to me after the show. He goes, man, that was heck of an opening, man. Do you, you open your shows like that often? And I go, no, I said, you know, anyway, I, I was really bitter. And he says that joke about the speeding ticket. Is that true? And I go, no, it's not true. I go, I make all this crap up. It's just, you, anyway, he walks away and some guy comes over and go, what did Gannon want with you? I go, Gannon. He goes, yeah, Frank Gannon. He's Letterman's coordinator. <laughs> oh no. So when my agent reached out to do the showcase that I saw Brian Regan on, they said, no, we've seen enough of Mr. Allen. And, uh, and I knew I had to leave. I knew I had to leave uh, before I burned every bridge that there was. You know, um, I had a lot of recovery to do as a human being. It's funny because we almost bump up always against the what got you here won't get you there, right? And so the um, I'm going to editorialize your life, let's say, but maybe you can help correct me if I'm wrong. But there's a certain amount of angst. There's um, there's this um, way you look at the world. Uh, there's this processing. You know, I had uh, Kelly Carlin on George Carlin's daughter on the podcast, and she was talking about how often comedians are the rebellious truth tellers because they see things just slightly different, and they're willing to say the uncomfortable truth that many people are think but are aren't willing to say. And so, there has to be this amount. I imagine this um, this slightly rebellious working things out in your life, working things out on stage, working things out in front of people, um, and there has to be that tension and that friction. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to to create your art. Um, but at a certain point, um, you know, you just burn out or get tired of it or just can't sustain it. Um, do you, is that kind of true, or am I just making stuff up now? Well, I never gave it a lot of thought, but I have always worked inside out. Um, you know, people ask what I did before I got married. I said I starved. I had really nothing to talk about. You know, um, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict, so half my act was alcohol and drugs. Why? What fueled that? Those addictions? I don't know. I started when I was fourteen, and I didn't quit till I was thirty. You know, I mm. mean, I um, ever since I picked up a drink. You know, they say the alcoholic remembers his first drink. I'll never forget it. It was a 7-7 seven, seven at my sister's wedding and something washed over me that was like, you know, somebody was, I, I heard one of Richard Pryor's friends was with him with the first time he took a hit off a crack pipe. And he said, I saw it in his face. Something changed. I saw it in his eyes, man. He, he found it. Whatever he was looking for, he found. And I felt that was what alcohol did for me. And then, you know, the, the cocaine I started doing later, uh, mainly because I was getting sloppy drunk and I needed some kind of pick me up to, to talk and function. And did um, everybody do cocaine in the eighties? It's I mean, I mean, absolutely. It I was doing it at Denny's way. one night. I just pulled it out at Denny's. I was waiting for my eggs and this manager comes over and goes, are you nuts? This is a felony. I mean, that's, it, it was so ubiquitous. I mean, I had clubs try to 
pay me in cocaine. And I was at least smart <laughs> enough to go, you know, at and is not going to take this. I mean, I know you think this is cash, but it's not, you know. So, uh, yes, it was everywhere in the 80s. Everywhere. And uh, it's interesting now. Um, I know it's out there, but and I don't think it's as prevalent. Um, I think younger generations have found other things <laughs> to move on to, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Ken, can you share with me the advice Seinfeld gave you? Oh, yeah. That was, we were, uh, did a show in Jersey at a college. Um, and that was a piece of work. Anyway, I finished my set and, and they're clapping and cheering and, and I'm walking off and he's standing there and he stops me and he goes, that, that's for you. I go, what? He goes, that applause. Listen to that. You get so much of that. It doesn't mean anything to you. And I go, ah. Anyway, I walk out. Now we're waiting for our checks after the show and we're talking. A very interesting couple things. Well, one of them, he says, I, I, so what do you got going on? You know, I'm certainly well known within the comedy community and just kind of breaking publicly. And uh, he said, well, we just did a sitcom pilot. And I said, well, what's it about? And he actually said that it's about nothing. <laughs> and I go, so when I saw the episode. I went, that comes from the horse's mouth. It was. And yeah, uh, we're yeah, there, there was, was about there was nothing 45 in that. <laughs> yeah, We're there for 45 minutes waiting for our checks. And I'm just whining and complaining and uh, because that's what I do. And uh, he says, can I say something to you? You know, and I said, please do. He goes, uh, in all your complaints. And he goes, there's been a myriad of them, a lot. Uh, I never heard you complain about how hard you work on your craft. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, the one thing you can control is your act. Just get that right. He said, this is a small industry. You get good at what you do. He said, the word will get out. He goes, I've never looked for work my entire career. You know, I just try to do the best I can at what I do. And people came to me and I thought, wow, you know, I'd like to tell you I ran home and, you know, incorporated it, but I never forgot that. And I've given that advice a hundred times in my career, you know, to, to young comics. You know, you know, you need a deal. You need this. You need that. No, you don't. You need to get better at what you do. And uh, somebody said Leno was holding court in uh, at the Improv one night, and one comic um, was complaining he couldn't get on the Tonight Show. And Leno said, "Change." And he said, "What do you mean change?" He goes, "Well, you want to get on the Tonight Show? They don't want what you have." change what you have. I'm not changing. He goes, then don't do the tonight show. I mean, to me, that's just so logical. I mean, if that's your goal in life, then figure out what it is you're doing that they don't like and then change. You know, for me, it was just this arbitrary thing. I want to do the tonight show, you know, and I, I remember a friend of mine, and this is the beauty of hanging around long enough, that your friends, your peers become executives. So, a friend of mine who was a comic, he's still a comic today, but became the talent coordinator for Letterman. So I call him up out of the clear blue. I haven't talked to him in 15 years. And I said, Hey, um, I'd love to audition for Letterman. He goes, uh, okay. Um, can you get in at Caroline's? So I, I had worked at Caroline's and Lewis, the, the guy that booked it, um, you know, liked me. So I call Lewis and he says, Oh, sure, man. Any Tuesday you want to come in, and set it up. It'd be great. So I set up the audition do my little set and then we're driving. I said, you guys still playing poker on Tuesday nights? He goes, yeah, every Tuesday. So I go over to the poker game and we're driving over in the cab and he says, look, here's the deal. He says, Dave may give me 22 spots for the year. 15 of them are already taken by regulars. And I'm, I'm making up these numbers, but they're, they're kind of in that ballpark. So it gives me seven spots for a new guy. And if I put you on at your age, I was probably 10 years ago, maybe. Uh, he said, uh, Dave's going to want to know why. So unless you got a movie or a book deal or, or something uh, outside of just a five minute, a three minute stand up set, you know, and I told him the truth. I said, look, man, at this point in my career, one letterman ain't going to do anything for me. I mean, honestly, I said, it's just a bucket list thing. You know, I've been around since 1978. I, I want to do the stupid show. I mean, I mean, again, it was like it, it, for, as a career, move, it, it meant nothing. It really meant nothing to go out and go. Well, I did a Letterman. You know that. You know that was kind of within the industry. 
it meant something. You know, I had a sitcom pilot in 2000. Uh, that meant more to me than a letterman. Somebody spent $850,000 trying to get me on television. And that meant a lot. It's a nice paperweight now. Uh, it didn't get picked up. <laughs> But, uh, you know, and I did Just for Laughs Montreal. Uh, that was huge for me. Uh, that was something I've always wanted to do. And I, again, I missed it with Roseanne and Tim Allen. And uh, they all got their deals out of there. Ellen, all of them got their deals out of Just for Laughs. And by the time I got there in 2000, it had it no longer were studio heads going to Just for Laughs. They were sending the third or fourth underling out there to, and then you had a, big process, but I did end up getting my deal. Uh, I met the agent that shopped me around LA up, up in, in Montreal. But by that, man, we were, um, we were rocking and rolling. I was enjoying life and, um, uh, having a blast. I'm having so much fun doing stand up comedy. Now I never, I've never had this kind of fun on stage. And, and what's changed, you know, so as you've gotten older, it's almost like, um, there are, uh, classes like you know class of 92 right and there's and everyone kind of comes up to age at a certain point and uh what i've read about you know say saturday night live you know saturday night live would always try to grab people from second city chicago uh and inevitably people right. kind of hit their breaking point within a kind of five six seven eight year window at the same time and they came up together and they all work together and they have their peak and then perhaps they have their fall together uh it almost seems like you kind of missed uh your window and I'm curious how you dealt with that. If there was ever this feeling of resentment or um, anger about that, or if it's just like turned more into a fuel of what's next. Like, do you look back? Do you look forward? How do you, how did you kind of deal with the fact that maybe you kind of missed this time in your career and your life based off of your age and timing and what have you? Well, actually, it's interesting because I was, you know, the book is written in a period. I got sober at 30 and then I got uh, uh, I saved. I, I came to, to accept Jesus uh, in my life um, when I was 38. And that's the eight year period that it was really, in, it was just an introspective life. Um, I was a scab. I, I can't think of a better way to describe it. I was a wound. I was an angry, bitter, jaded, cynical, foul-mouthed human being that tried to figure out how to not get beat up every night on stage and um, uh, tried to figure out why I wasn't a better husband or a better father than I was. Um, and so when you're, when you're working out your therapy in front of 300 people a night, <laughs> You know, uh, the industry kind of looks and goes, yeah, he's, you know, I remember I had an audit and I threw my keys in the lap of the audit, the IRS audit. I just slid them across the table. So take everything I own. I'm sick of you people. And uh, anyway, that was the last audit I had. I think they put a note in my file. He's ready to blow something up, you know, uh, and we should leave him alone. So I was making a good living. I was, I started working in churches and I started sharing, um, uh, you know, my, my faith journey with the church. Uh, I was doing corporate work. Uh, I was out of clubs for almost 20 years. Uh, I walked out one night, nine 11 was, uh, um, I was in Vegas when nine 11 hit and they made us work that night. And I, I called my manager the next day and I said, I got to find another place to do what I do. I can't, I'm not going to be in clubs for seven nights anymore. I'm done. So anyway, we put it out on work churches. I did one church in one year. I mean, a whole year I did one church. I mean, when your resume is casinos and nightclubs, pastors tend to hesitate giving you the pulpit for an hour, you know. And uh, anyway, I hooked up with the singer Bill Gaither. Bill Gaither got a, almost a chapter in the book. Um, it, it, his stamp of approval on me uh, at least opened those doors up for me. And um, as an artist... Not having to work nightclubs, uh, the church was a perfect fit because I tell stories and they're used to having people use metaphors and speak for 45 minutes without interrupting. And I didn't talk to the crowd. I don't like doing crowd work. Um, I just like telling my stories and they were receptive and respond, you know. So, uh, when I got the sitcom, when I got the deal for the sitcom, that was uh, the happy wife, happy life thing. And, um, 
I thought, good, I've arrived. This is, and, and it's funny because I had a comic in the Christian world come to me, really famous guy, say, is that what you want? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, I'm as famous as I want to be. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I stay in this world and I get my strokes and everybody loves me, and, and, but I can go out in the world and eat a meal <laughs> and nobody bothers me. Nobody, you know, they don't know who I am and they don't care. And I kind of like that. And I said, you know, I never thought about it. Um, but I said to Tammy, when we were just getting our marriage back on track, and I said, you do realize it's three weeks in L.A. and one week at home. Uh, but then that week, I want to go out on the road and do comedy, you know. And so she says, so you'll be gone like you were before, 50 weeks a year, you know, 230 plus days. And I go, we need to make that decision now. Somebody's investing a lot of money in this thing. And I said, the, the, the upside is if I get three years on a sitcom, then we're pretty much set. You know, we have a low maintenance lifestyle. We're not looking to buy Lamborghinis. And anyway, when it passed, you know, I really wasn't that upset. I just kind of looked at it and said, you know, if it was meant to be, it would have, you know, we did the best we could on it. And um, anyway, I moved on from there. But dry bar hit three years ago. And it changed my life. Um, you know, my dream was always to be a draw. I wanted people, you know, it means so much to me to know that somebody's sitting at home, they see my name in the paper and they go, wow, let's buy a ticket. Let's get dressed. Let's get in the car. You know, I don't know about you, but it takes a lot for me to go out and see a show. I mean, it, especially a comedy show. I mean, I, you know, so if I'm showing up and it's something special for me. So I don't take it for granted. And I, I do enough now uh, back in clubs. I've been in clubs for two years, uh, you know, prior to uh, COVID. Uh, we were really rocking. Um, you know, th those videos on Drybar went viral. And the Internet uh, was everything that I thought The Tonight Show and Letterman might have done for me in the 70s and early 80s. But um you don't need network television anymore. You really don't. Every name on the list now, I walk into a club, I go, who's that? Oh, he's a YouTube guy. He's a Instagram guy. He's a TikTok guy. A gal, you know, and it's like, wow. You know, look at Robert Kennedy's running his whole campaign on uh, social media. The networks won't have him on. So he's going to every podcaster in America, man. This is going to be the first major campaign really run by the new media. And we'll see if it makes a dent or not. I don't know. Hmm. And when you say it takes off, it's uh, like I'm looking right now, dry, dry bar double feature, 7.7 7 million views. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's amazing to me how um, it's amazing to me that if you go back to yourself in the late 70s or the 80s, or maybe at, at any point in your career, and you thought about what the next five or 10 or 15 or 20 years would look like there was there's no way for you to anticipate that your career could have gone the way it went but it sounds like you just stuck with it and i mean i feel like that's a real lesson here is like we i think we spend a lot of time and effort trying to control everything and trying to control the outcome and when things don't go the way we want you know when um when the pilot didn't land uh you know bob odenkirk in his book there's a 10-year period where nothing's really happening for him but the line that stuck out with me is he said, I worked just as hard on the projects that failed as I did on the ones that succeeded. And there was like a 10 year period where, where he directed movies, he wrote movies, he did pilots, he put every year, he put a new project together and for 10 years, nothing took off, but he worked just as hard on those yeah. than the ones that didn't. And so I love that you say that at this point in your career, you're having more fun, that, uh, that you're loving it. Um, I, I mean, it's, there's a lot we can take from that. Well, I, again, I, you know, I don't, I didn't have a plan. That's part of the book. I write in a book, you know, I, I didn't have a three-step, five-step goal plan. I was just trying to put a roof over my family's head and not kill somebody. I mean, it was like, you know, I, I was really broken, you know, and, um, and it had nothing to do with, you know, you I don't know. And it, it, the, the marriage was something that when it fell apart, we wound up, you know, with divorce papers and stuff. And uh, it, it literally broke my heart. Um, 
night after night in those hotel rooms thinking that I was not going to be with her, but I couldn't be a decent man to her. You know, it was like, you know, I wouldn't be married to me either. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, it's funny to me when I, I had friends, I had some friends who've been married three or four times. Then I go, I don't know how you do it, man. I said, this is it for me. I told her you walk out, I'm done. I'm not getting married again. This is it. I, it's a lot of work and it's, but it's, uh, it's worth the effort. But it's to me, when a woman says, I don't want you anymore, it's not, hey, screw you. I'm going to go find another one. It's what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know, for me, it was introspection. It was a time for self reflection. Uh, and, you know, in the book, we end the first chapter. I find out she's having an affair in California. And uh, my reaction was, you know, get home. It's bad enough. I got to, you know, uh, you're doing what you're doing, but I got to pay for it. It's on my American Express card. You know, I mean, that's a double whammy. So get home. And uh, her girlfriend calls and says, uh, she's too devastated to fly. Uh, she'll be home in the morning. And I believe this. If she had come home that night, we wouldn't be married today. I would have cut her. I would have cut her verbally, like, uh, and never been able to take it back. I mean, it was hurt, you know, but I had a night alone and self respect reflection and realizing, God, I was, I'm a horrible person to live with. I mean, no wonder, you know, and years later when she shared it publicly, she said, you know, she made me take the word affair out of the book. She said, it wasn't an affair. An affair gives the reader the belief that there's some romance. I just wanted a guy to be nice to me. I wanted somebody to be nice to me. You weren't. And for a man to not at least reflect on that and go, yeah, you know, okay, I can see where you're coming from. And uh, believe me, I got it. You know, and you talk about uh, projection, 5, 10, 15. That was my gerbil. I wrote about the gerbil in the book. Um, I'm looking at the gerbil gathering sticks, one side, riding them over, stacking them up, running, spinning a wheel. And she comes in and goes, what's with you in the gerbil? <laughs> you know? yeah. And I said, look at it, man. She goes, what do you mean? I go, it sticks and gather them up and all that. And I go, if I project 5, 10, 15 years from now, that's our life. She goes, what do you mean? I go, oh, I make a few bucks. We buy a few things. They wear out. We take them to the landfill. If I'm lucky, I get a sitcom movie deal, make a lot of money, but we're still buying sticks. They're nice sticks, but they still wear out. We're taking them to the landfill. Vegas is our wheel, or maybe we take the kids to Disneyland or something. But I said to her, I go, if that's my life for the next 15, 20 years, just gathering up sticks and stuff, I'm checking out. And she said, you checked out years ago, pal. You haven't been here for years. You know, most times she, you know, she'd talk to me and I'd have to ask her to repeat herself, you know, four times. I'm sorry. What, what did you say? I was just in my head trying to figure out, you know, something. I don't know what I was trying to figure out, but, um, so for everything to have accumulated to the dry bar and then this book, uh, we got interest in the book now that uh, they're going to put a pilot episode together and um, we're going to shop it and shoot it. And, um, you know, I said to Tammy, you know, if I can get three more years, I'll be 70 years old. What a perfect time to be successful, you know? If I'd have had three or, three or four year run back when I was 26, I'd be dead from a cocaine overdose, <laughs> so, you know, and um, there's something for surviving and there's something, there's a deep appreciation for my fans. I love my fans. Uh, they know me, they know Tammy, they know my kids, they know because of the stories that you tell. And, uh, you know, I have no desire to, I hit politics, uh, I call it hit and run, you know, if I come up with a funny line. You know, uh, I'll make a jab at somebody, you know, and, uh, but it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, you talked about Carlin and, uh, I don't think anybody did it better than him. Maybe Bill Burr. I love Burr. Bill, Bill, Bill Burr is remarkable and I can't understand how he thinks the way he thinks. Uh, because if you listen to his podcast, if you listen to his specials, I mean, yeah. he's, but that's Boston. You, you walk, you stand at the bus stop. There's six Bill Burr standing there, you know, I mean, to me, I mean, that's what I loved about Boston. Everybody was funny and sharp and just cutting. And I mean, I, I had to get out of there though. I would have killed myself. So, so the book you've been mentioning a few times is called, are we there yet? My journey from messed up to a meaningful life. It, it does come out in September of 23. So if you're listening to this after the fact, then it is available. If you're listening to this before, then you can certainly pre-order it. But 
I'm curious because I've heard you speak about the idea of are we there yet and and almost the the feeling of impatience. Um, but you know, as you've gotten older <laughs> and now found this new yeah. part of your career, um, you know, why write a book? Because um, I think the theme of most of our conversation is you keep doing stuff, you keep getting back up, you keep with it, you keep on your craft, you keep on your artwork. But um, nobody, gosh, how do I say this? I'm, I'm trying to say like, like, who the heck are you to write a book? Who the heck? Are, like, do you know what I mean? Like, right. like, did you ever have that moment where you're like, I'm going to write a book because I feel like I deserve it? Or what does this book really mean in, in terms of how it fits into your life? Uh, I wrote the book, uh, honestly, uh, for my grandkids and my kids. Um, I wanted our story told to them. Um, you know, they were really little when we went through all of that. Um, you know, I, when they were getting married, I sat both my boys down and said, I saddled you with some baggage that you're completely unaware of. That computer inside of you is, it's just sitting there waiting for your wife to trigger it. And she will. And you're going to act in a way that you find really unbecoming to the man you think you are. And I said, come and talk to me. I'll share some stuff with you. And one night I watched my oldest boy. He had come back from Iraq. He had PTSD and some TBI, traumatic brain injury and stuff. Anyway, he him and his wife were having some issues. And leaving his four-year-old girls, my granddaughter's dance recital, he snapped in the parking lot and ripped the uh, the door off his uh, uh, SUV, um, his minivan, just ripped the door right off. I mean, he's a bull. Um, and his wife, this was so beautiful. She just sat and watched him just completely just lose it. And when he finally got out of exhaustion, I've been there. I know what that's like. And she walks over and she says, why don't you go get, uh, catch your breath and then we'll get the door back on and we'll go home. And to me, that's such a, I, I thank God that that's the woman in his life. She understands it isn't about her. It isn't about anything. It's just this bile that lives inside us that every now and then has to come out and it comes out like that. And, um, you know, um, that's one of those moments where I told him, I said that I put that in you. I did, you know, and, um, but if you work it out, you'll get it out and you'll be a better husband and a better man for it, you know, and, uh, I'm not condoning it. You know, what you did was not good. You can't be doing, can't be ripping doors off your vehicles, you know, but um, uh, there's a reason for it. And um, anyway, the, that's why I wrote the book. Um, I, I, if I sell six copies and my kids read it, my grandkids read it, I'm okay with it, you know. Um, but, you know, it'd be nice if they do the, the series on it. Um, I won't be in it. I, I can't play me, you know. I might be able to play my dad or my grandfather. <laughs> you know? but, but anyway... Um, and I got a movie coming out, a small independent faith film. I did my first acting, um, on location for two weeks and I don't get acting. I don't understand it. You know, to me, this is acting. Hey, Jeff, walk in the room and go, Hey, okay. Now turn the other way and go, Hey, and I look that way and go, Hey, now we're going to turn the cameras around. We're going to get her reaction to you saying, Hey, hey. <laughs> and now go sit down for three hours. Okay. I, I got it. I got it. You know? I, I love stand up and it's just right there, bam, and you know right away if you did well or not, you know. You've mentioned this a few times now, but I'm curious, what does religion give you? I think first of all, I believe it to be true. So uh um my initial response I went through self-help. I went through new age. I went through Buddhism. I went, I finally ended up on a grand, um, uh, humanism. I was reading that when I met a guy who put the Bible in my hands and about a year into our friendship, uh, he had signed me up for some Bible study tapes uh, from a church in Texas. Anyway, I never opened them up. Um, I really had no interest in it. Um, I'd crack the Bible open in hotels and go, eh, you know, I don't, I don't get it. Well, anyway, uh, she took the kids and I thought she was gone for good, you know, and I had all these Bible tapes and I opened the first one up and it was on the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and the start of Ecclesiastes is meaningless, meaningless, all in life is meaningless. That was my conclusions after eight years. 
of looking. Nothing mattered. You know, Tammy would shake me. We're losing the house. And I go, I don't care. You know, difference does it make? You know, big house, small house. You know, we'll have a roof. We'll get somewhere. You know, she goes, who talks like that? I go, I don't care. I, I'm sorry. I want to care. You know, I, I did it. I didn't wake up in the morning and look at all the responsibility I had as a, as a man and go, oh, well, you know, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, I, but I didn't understand why I would work hard and succeed at whatever. So when I got the first Bible sermon that I ever listened to, I got this out of it. Life without God will have no meaning. Without meaning to your life, there's no purpose. Without purpose to your life, suicide. And I thought, that's true. That's a deep, profound truth. I believe that. So if that's in the Bible, there must be other things in the Bible that are true. And I just started studying the Bible um, and with really no goal in mind. I certainly didn't, you know, I, I had no, I had a, I wouldn't say an animosity towards Christians, but it, to me, they were irrelevant. Um, I didn't understand them, you know, and I certainly didn't understand worship, you know, but when I got to Genesis 1-1, God, in the beginning, God, it broke me. And I, I knew in my heart and soul there was a God. And it scared me. And I called my friend up who we had been friends for uh, about a year now. And I was crying on the phone. There's a God. There's an actual God. And he goes, yeah, I've been trying to tell you for like a year. You know? <laughs> and he goes, you got a problem with that. I go, how about blasphemy? That's starting with that, cursing him, denying him. You know, I mean, it, I, he said, have you gotten to the cross? And I go, the cross? He said, oh, I can't ruin the ending for you, man. You know? <laughs> And uh, he said, go study uh, John or they could go into the New Testament. I spent uh, those early weeks studying in the all Old Testament. Job, I love Job. Job made me laugh. I mean, as a cynic, you can't read Job and not laugh. I mean, you know, I mean, it's one thing for your cows to die. It's another thing for them to get fireballed, you know, <laughs> from some thing in the sky. So anyway, I um, I dove into that book. And uh, eventually, I just got on my knees and said, Jesus, if you are who you claim to be, then I'm yours. And if you're not, it'll be just another thing in the long line of uh, Band-Aids I've tried to put on my broken soul. And um, the next day, I woke up. I was in a hotel room in uh, Texas, and something felt different. And I sat on the end of my... I mean, it felt so different that it was like something I had to process. And uh, you've heard the term lightness of being. It was that. I was just light. I was like, holy cow, I feel, I mean, I feel good. I mean, I felt good before, but this, and then I thought, oh yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. Is that what this is? I don't know. And then there was this image in my mind's eye of a valley and there were all these markers. I write about this in the book, but it's, I was here. He was always there just waiting. You know, and uh, that's the verse. I would, I stand behind the door. I'm waiting for, you know, knock and I'll answer, you know. And one of the interesting things for me, I share this in the book. It wasn't a road to Damascus moment like Paul had where he got struck blind <laughs> by the Holy Spirit. But my car broke down, which it always did. And uh, I looked at the my back seat. I, and I said to my son, I saw a gas station about a mile back. Let's go. And Tammy, who braced herself for the tirade, you know, that was my invitation to break into a self-pitying tirade, you know, that I'm the only one that has broken cars and the world is against me. And anyway, she says, that's it. And I go, it just hit me. Mechanics pray too, you know? So there's a mechanic on his knees somewhere going, you know, I need some work, you know? And she goes, that's it. I said, you know, the Bible said that Jesus said, don't worry about this life. I'll send you a new counselor in the form of the Holy Spirit. And um, I believe that's the counselor. I have a new conscience. I have a different conscience, which wrestles with the old. You know, Paul talks about the nature, you know, dying to yourself. Uh, Buddha talked about that. You know, your desires are what's making you miserable. And I just couldn't get rid of my desire to get rid of my desires. So I was constantly in this cycle of misery. <laughs> but that's the, the nature. Uh, my nature is the first 40 years of my life and it's skepticism, it's cynicism, it's, you know, um, so it wrestles with this divine spirit that says to love, forgive and do for others, you know? And, um, it's interesting. I, if I wasn't a Bible believing Christian, I'd be an Ayn Rand objectivist because I felt reason and logic would get me through life. But, I read Atlas Shrugged 
10 years after being a believer. And I loved it when I read it in the early 90s. Um, just it was so profound to me. And when I read it a second time, I went, there's no children. In it. There's no colors. There's no beauty. It's just black and white reason and logic. And what a way to live, you know, that everything has to be proven to a point. And I'll just, you know, Pascal was right. If I'm wrong, who's been harmed by my faith? You know, I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. And those are the questions I ask at the end of the book. You know, um, who, what defines you? That's important. Um, if it's the next job, the next house, car, you know, whatever, your, your circumstances will always change. So therefore, your inner being will always be in flux. Uh, I think Sartre said it. I'm not sure. Again, I don't hold me to this, but I heard somebody say that he said it. Um, that in order for something finite to have meaning, it has to be connected to something infinite and fixed. He didn't use the word God. Hold on. For, for something finite to have meaning, it needs to be connected to something infinite and fixed that never changes and moves. Otherwise, it's just constantly, which is, he's the father of existentialism, which means, you know, his whole life was in flux. And he said this at the end of his life. So I, I believe that. I believe if you connect to the divine, um, then it's not going to change. That doesn't move and that doesn't change, whatever that is. And again, I, you know, I'm not a theologian. Um, but, um, it does this, my house, my car, my relationships, they don't define me. I try, and then that gets to the next question. What do you value? Um, is it your bank account? Is it the car? You, I mean, all of the materialism, or is it your integrity, your honor, your word, um, how you treat your wife, your kids, your neighbor, your friends, you know, all of those things matter do they matter more than you know again it's these are introspective things you know somebody said an unexamined life is not worth living so i wanted to call the book an examined life because that was a period of my life where i i just was constantly looking at everything um in in me to really just kind of try to be a better human being whatever that meant uh, where does your hope lie? You know, um, uh, ask yourself uh, if you have hope, where is it, what is it in? Is it in the government? Boy, you're in trouble. You know, um, you know, uh, is it in institutions? Is it in your job? Your job can go away tomorrow. Is it in your family? Get T-boned at a red light. You know, I, again, um, so the hope, I hope that I'm right about my faith. I hope, but if I'm not, again, um, I'm, think I'm better for it based on the standard of the book that I read that I believe to be the divine word, you know? So, um, uh, I'm, you know, my wife, when it was funny, when I told her I was a Christian, she said, what does that mean? She was abused by Christians, her parents. So she goes, what does that mean? I go, you know, I don't know. I really don't, but I'm to love you as he loved the church. She goes, how, what does that mean? I go, well, he died. Uh, we're his church. We're the church. We're the bride, his bride. So, I'm to sacrifice for you. And she laughed because she knew how self-centered I was. <laughs> so, you know, but within a month, she saw a change. Something had changed in me, you know, and um, I, I wish I could give it to the world. I really do. I wish I could have given it to my brother. He was in such turmoil. He was a crack addict and just never really stopped the storm within that raged within him. Never could get it, you know. And he told me, he goes, I want to. I pray. I, I can't, I'm, you know. I said, uh, I don't understand it. I really don't, you know, but, um, th that's, I'm not talking to you and I'm not here today without my faith. I know that I'm dead from something. I, you know, I, I, I know that in my heart of hearts. And I sat, I stood in my yard and I had, I had a 50 pound heavy bag. I used to beat when the rage would come. And I would hit that bag and just pound it till I was exhausted. And one night I was hitting it, hitting it, and it fell off whatever was holding it, the hook. And I picked it up and I was throwing it against my cinder block fence repeatedly. Just, and again, it's a heavy bag. So six tosses and I was pretty exhausted, but I'm screaming at the heavens. Why? You know, and, uh, I, I just, my family, I look at the door. They're all, you know, the kids are crying. She's just irritated. 
And uh, anyway, I walk into the house and my son walks over. He's probably five years old. He goes, you scare me. And I said, I scare myself, you know. Um, and then something washed over me that night. And I looked at Tammy and I said, it will never happen again. She goes, bullshit. And I said, no. Have I ever said that to you? She goes, why does that matter? I go, because my father said it to my mother over and over again. My brother said it to his wife over and over again. I always knew it would happen again. So I never bothered to tell you it will never happen again. I'm sorry for all those outbursts, but I never once promised you it would never happen again. She goes, what's different? I go, I don't know. Something just changed. And I believe that was the night screaming at the heavens that God said he's had enough. And um, it wasn't a month or two later, probably or three that I just finally made a formal commitment and said, I'm yours. And um, so whatever that is, you know, and if you followed me around, you wouldn't think I was anything special, you know, and that's, that's the problem the world has with all of us believers is they don't understand that the prerequisite is just, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. And I just need something, you know, and um, if you're it, and it seems to be, you know, um, my priorities changed. Comedy became like three on the list. You know, um, it's a way to make a living. If it went away tomorrow, you know, I'd be sad. But I wouldn't jump off a building in L.A., you know. Um, and we're going to ride this out. We're having a blast. Um, you know, she's get to travel with me now occasionally when she comes out. And I was telling, one of my newest routines. I love telling this story because it's so true. Anybody married knows this. Um, we were like visiting the kids in Montana and we're in the car three, four hours a day, you know, and I really, I look at her one time and I go, we're at a point in our marriage now that we need each other. Every conversation we have turns into a game of charades. We can't remember a darn thing without each other. And we just go back and forth, you know, um, the other day it was cocktail sauce. We couldn't remember what she goes. I've got some shrimp at the grocery store and I got that red stuff. Uh, what's that stuff with the horseradish? And we sat there for 10 minutes trying to think of cocktail sauce. And anyway, we finally gave up because we couldn't remember it. And then 20 minutes later, we're in the swimming pool and she yells across the pool, cocktail sauce. <laughs> I go, That's it. That's it. That's where we're at in our life now. We need each other to complete the sentences, you know, and all of that. Uh, and I hope to make it to the end with her. But if not, I'm not getting married again. I'll tell you that. Oh, my goodness. Jeff Allen, thank you so much. I mean, what the inspiration I take from your story is, uh, of course, the persistence, the working on your craft, keep going. Um, you know, never giving up. But more than that, it's the transition from like all the stuff that you think is important when you're younger, you know, the ego, the career, the achievements, you know, and maybe this is part of this is just maturing, maybe part of it's survivor bias. Um, but it sounds like what you're doing now and where you are in your life is a lot more free than where you used to be. Yeah. And I think all of us who become business owners or entrepreneurs, we don't, or anyone who's creative, we do it to express you know, who we are and what we want to do, but, but we're all looking for that freedom. And so I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thanks. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. You're free. Um, you know, uh, the pressure that you have, I think when you're younger, um, is just in the unknown, you know, again, if you project, you know, you're 30 years old. My God, if I live to be 80, what am I going to do for the next 50 years? You know, and then if you look at the institutions around you, you go, <laughs> yeah, I would pull up in a bunker somewhere, you know. So somebody said, are, are we preppers? You know, and I said, we're kind of sort of preppers. We go to Costco and we buy for a month. So if the apocalypse hits after we get home, we're going to look like geniuses. But a month later, we're empty. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you guys are Christian, but not too Christian. Uh, you're conservative and watch Fox News, but not too much. And you are preppers, but only as far as like a big Costco run. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting about the conservative thing. It was, it was interesting. Um, I probably realize I'm more of a classic liberal than I am a conservative. Um, oh, don't say that out loud. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I got booed one night in my audience and I said, no, listen to me. I said, it could, the liberals used to be afraid of the surveillance state. They were always in fear of the government. They were always for civil rights. 
and it just seems to have flipped to where, you know, all the guys I follow on Substack are, are uh, guys that have been kicked out of the progressive movement, you know, Glenn Greenwald and Barry Weiss. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I'm reading everybody now because uh, uh, COVID opened my eyes to the institutions and they're really not on my side or our side. I, I don't believe they are at all. Um, you know, just based on their behavior, I, I would think they're not. Well, you know, well, it's interesting, you know, like, like if we reference Jordan Peterson, oh, I love Jordan uh, you know, Jordan Peterson, Peterson 12 Rules to Life. It's interesting. I, I was looking at a thread to try and get a sense of his political leaning. You know, he's Canadian. He's a fellow Canadian um, like me. And, uh, um, you know, I think what I've discovered is that he's actually like a classical liberal, like, like in the, right. in the classical sense of European liberal. Um, and yet, Everyone thinks he's super conservative and super that. Um, and he, he kind of just talks in common sense to me with, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't think anyone today would, would consider him a liberal, but that's apparently no, where he may fall. To me, Cause I, when it comes to all of that, cause I, I, I avoid it because it's so divisive and, it, and, it, and you'd have to get, you know, they get nuanced and I just want to be left alone. You know, I, I, I want to live my life and I, I, I like to, think that the safety net wouldn't be abused, but it, why wouldn't it? it? You know, human nature is what human nature is, you know, and our founding fathers kind of put in place a, a system supposedly to kind of check and balance each power. And it's been just kind of melded into one big uniparty. Uh, the Republicans are feckless and they do nothing. All their whole platform is, uh, well, we're not them. And, the Democrat Party is their whole platform is we're not them. And they hate you. No, they hate you. And, and and you step out of the whole thing and you look and you go, I'm just looking at it from a functional point of view, you know, if, and it's not functioning well. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's not, I mean, you know, and. But, but here's, but here's the thing. It never has. And I, I think there's this misconception that it used to work and it doesn't now. But, but you know, uh, the reading I've done about the, you know, the independence and then the civil war and then, you know, under Grant, I read his biography. He wasn't a great president. Yeah. If we go into no. the 1890s, if we go into the 1900s, like, like politics was always politics. It, right. it never has worked well, ever. No, no, it's because human beings are, you know, and I always like the people who deny the sinful nature of man. I go, well, watch a news cycle. I should kind of, it's probably one of the most empirically verifiable facts and most denied facts in our life. And I said, you know, you, you try to figure out a system that can hold evil in human nature at bay. That's all. I mean, it's human nature to loot treasuries and you know, look out for yourself and nepotism, all of that stuff. I mean, you know, uh, so I'm not surprised that it's it's broken. But, um, you know, um, I, as a comic, if I was to go that way, it would be a perfect it would be a beautiful time to, to jump in to the foray because there's a lot of fodder for all of it. And um, I just, uh, I'm just happy doing what I'm doing. And um, I can't wait to see Jeff Allen in his 80s. It's gonna, you're gonna be on the. Well, maybe you won't say this, but you're gonna be on the fuck it tour. You're just gonna be like, ah, fuck it. I'm gonna say what <laughs> I'm gonna say. All this stuff that I want to say. I'm gonna like go that. down. Like I'm gonna shirt. go down. But yeah. you know, you know, blaze all of glory. All the things I wanted to say, but just because I promised my wife I wouldn't say them. You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, have, oh, amazing. Um, amazing. Last question I have for you, because we do have to wrap it up. And I know you have a busy day ahead of you. For you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? What does it all come down to? Um, wow. You know what? It's interesting. I read a, 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 a book, one of my many books. I think it was Stephen Covey, Seven Habits or whatever. And this is what really kind of kickstarted me was write your own obituary and I didn't get past the first line I my kids said he always had time for us and it just broke me because I realized I never spent any time with my kids you know I was always on the road and then when I'd come home you know and certainly at a certain age 
they just are, they're never home. They're always at friends' houses or whatever. So to me, it's what my family will say about me when I'm gone. And I'm making up for a lot of lost time. I'm doing what I can. I mean, I'm throwing cash at them. I'm throwing cars at them. <laughs> no, I'm not. But I'm just trying to figure out how, um, yeah, when you sit down and write your own obituary, what do you want people to say? And then compare it to the way you're living your life. And I, I got some changes to make, but I'm it, it, that matters to me, you know. And in the end, you know, Carlin, I got his entire library uh, encyclopedia, and I listened to maybe two of them. I grew up just admiring the guy. I got a chance to meet him in Vegas. Um, one of my favorite all time comics. And, uh, but, you know, Mark Twain, they, uh, they lament you for an hour and they forget you for a lifetime, you know? So I, I hope people enjoy what I do. I'm a distraction for now and I'm having a blast and I love what I do. But, um, in the end, when they wheel me out or whatever in the urn, cause we decided we're just going to get torched. Um, you know, uh, it's just ashes and uh, it's the memories that, uh, you know, that's what I, my first question to the divine, if I stand in front of Jesus is going to be why Alzheimer's, why dementia, why take the memories of all the diseases you've given us down here? Why that? You know, that's my biggest fear is losing my mind. You know, and um, some people think I'm already nuts, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> different way. 